The first sexual revolution, and those of us with gray hair can actually remember it, began in 1965 in California. The cost of that revolution has been huge, and the casualties have been staggering. Consider the cost of fatherless homes and fatherless children since the 1970s. The cost of sexually transmitted diseases, the epidemics we've had, including AIDS, and I'm not just talking about the financial cost, but the health cost to, to individuals. The cost of broken marriages, and there's no way to estimate the financial cost or the relational hurt in those situations. The emotional cost that promiscuity brings to bear on everyone who participates, and that's what that sexual revolution was about. And clearly we all recognize this, the cost in the number of abortions in America, 61 million since Roe versus Wade. Now, Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973, eight years after the beginning of that sexual revolution. It actually was a public policy decision. Yes, it was a court ruling. But the purpose was to fix the problem of free love and the resulting children that showed up after free love. The phrase, make love not war was not necessarily an anti-war slogan, but a make love slogan. All of that was yesterday, but the forces of that revolution, and I'm not just talking about people, but the powers and the principalities behind it, continue to occupy the ground that they took during that sexual revolution. We've now entered the, sex, the second sexual revolution in some sense, it's the grandchild of the first revolution. It's two generations away from the sexual revolution. In the same way that the first sexual revolution allured people away from societal norms, so the second revolution encourages yet another step away from societal norms. During the first, during that same period, we heard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak of the need to judge people by the content of their character. And yet at the same time, what character was, was being redefined. A true gentleman would not just have sex with a woman, but he'd pay for the abortion after. Where was the Me Too movement when women were being wholesalely abused? Now it's not just character that's being redefined, but nature itself and what is natural. Now it's bodies and bodily functions that are being altered, oftentimes irreparably. What should our response be? I submit that it should be the same response that it always should be. It should be truth and grace, not one or the other. Truth is hard, but it's true. Grace is loving, but oftentimes it's wishy-washy. As you know, in 1973, only the Catholic Church stood against Roe versus Wade. It was several decades before the evangelicals fully engaged. Today, 47 years after Roe, the United Church is making major headway on the life issue. Unfortunately, we're 61 million children too late. It's very good that truth and grace are presiding. There's pregnancy care centers meeting women in their time of need, and there's right to life groups and groups that advocate the truth about what abortion really is. And when you have truth and grace, you have Jesus. You have the presence of God, and it can't be stopped. Thank God for his grace and the progress that's being made today, but that was 47 years ago, and we still have work to do. Would that we, even with a gathering like this, become aware and begin to work together right here at the get-go and not wait 47 years to, to emerge and begin to make a difference. The issue of today is the second sexual rev revolution. Its ideology is distorting what God created and how God wanted his creation to function. Right now, right now, we need to be informed, we need to be compassionate, and we need to stand together, just as we are in the life issue. 
Now, please understand there are many ideologies in America. You can be a communist, and that's part of America. You can, you can have that ideology. You can be a Nazi. You can have that ideology. Thank God it doesn't preside. In this particular situation, we have the clash of two ideologies, and one should not rule over the other. But unfortunately, it appears that one is trying to be intolerant. And that's what we're wanting to talk about tonight. How we can address this transgender moment with truth and with grace and make a difference for the weeks, months, and years to come. I'm going to invite you to sign up uh, to our uh, mailing uh, list for our citizen newsletter. If you uh, don't already get it, there's no cost to it, but we'll pass around these uh, sign-up sheets where you can sign it and be informed about what's going on with a bi-monthly newsletter. And before, I, uh, before we have our special presenter tonight, uh, a special presenter needs to come up and introduce the special presenter. And that person I'm going to invite up is uh, Dr. Andrew Walker. Dr. Walker is an associate professor of Christian Ethics and Apologetics at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's also the executive director of the Carl F. H. Henry Institute for Evangelical Engagement. He writes frequently at such places as National Review, Providence Journal, the Gospel Coalition, and Public Discourse. In his role at Southern Seminary, he researches and writes about the intersection of Christian ethics, public policy, and the church's social witness. He is passionate about helping Christians understand the moral demands of the gospel. He is the author or editor of 10 books, including God and the Transgender Debate. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Religious Studies from Southwest Baptist University. He's, he's received his Master of Divinity and Master of Theology and his Doctor of Philosophy in Christian Ethics from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. He's an avid, avid long-distance runner where most of us are reluctant long-distance runners. And he and his wife and three daughters live in Louisville. Andrew, would you please come up and introduce our distinguished guest? Well, it's uh, a real privilege and delight to be with you this evening. Uh, what Kent did not tell you is I am a former employee of the Family Foundation. So I have my former boss in attendance, and I'm now a professor at Southern Seminary, so I have my current boss here in attendance and Dr. Herschel York. Uh, so I'm going to mind my P's and Q's this evening while I'm here. Uh, but it's really good to be with you all. And I have uh, the easiest job of the evening, uh, and that's to simply introduce uh, a very, very good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine who I've known for over 10 years now. We worked together at the Heritage Foundation in D.C. Uh, and worked very closely. He's a dear friend. Uh, he is a, a colleague. He is a mentor to me. Uh, and one of those individuals that I just look up to uh, just generally in life, and that is Dr. Ryan T. Anderson. He is the William E. Simon Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation and the founder and editor of Public Discourse, which is the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute of Princeton, New Jersey. He is the author of numerous books, When Harry Became Sally, Responding to the Transgender Moment, and Truth Overruled, the future of marriage and religious freedom, and he is the co-author of What is Marriage, Man and Woman of Defense, and Debating Religious Liberty and Discrimination. Dr. Anderson's research has been cited by two U.S. Supreme Court justices, Justice Samuel Alito and Justice Clarence Thomas, in two Supreme Court cases. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton University, graduating Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude, and he received his doctoral degree in political philosophy from the University of Notre Dame. Would you please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Ryan T. Anderson. It's a privilege to be with you. Um, and I know tonight's topic um, is a difficult, it's a sensitive topic. Um, 
Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, it's a difficult topic. It's a sensitive topic. It's also a vitally important topic. Um, this is not something that I set out to become an expert on. Uh, five, ten years ago, this wasn't on anyone's radar screen. Um, you know, as a child, as an undergraduate, as a grad student, I didn't think, when I grow up, I want to be an expert on gender ideology or gender dysphoria or transgender issues. And what got me involved in this issue um, were people, um, hearing about real people who had been victimized by a harmful ideology. Uh, real life human beings who felt uncomfortable in their own bodies and thought that their best option in life was to make radical transformations to their bodies. Uh, and then many of these people have shared their testimony of um, regretting those decisions. Some of the most powerful videos I've ever seen in my life have been of people who transitioned and then detransitioned. Uh, and that's really what prompted me to do the research. This is um, a book that Andrew mentioned during the introduction that I uh, researched and wrote two years ago, then it was published a year and a half ago. And um, it just goes through what do we know about the philosophy, the science, and the medicine on these issues. Uh, during the q and I'll be joined by Andrew and Denny Burke, two theologians who will get kind of like a full picture. Uh, I'm not a theologian, so I'm going to stick to uh, philosophy, to science, to medicine. Um, I'm trained in political philosophy. I'm able to kind of analyze those sorts of questions. We'll leave it to the theologians to answer some of the loftier um, questions. But to a certain extent, just from reason alone, from science, philosophy, medicine, um, you can understand what's going on and what's going wrong on these issues. And so the videos that I had seen were people who had transitioned and then detransitioned. And the most troubling part of these videos were people who had transitioned as teenagers. Uh, and frequently in our culture, it's young women who don't feel comfortable in our culture. Our culture has expectations for young women that are unrealistic, expectations that aren't in accord with the truth. And young women who feel uncomfortable are being told that the problem is with their bodies, uh, that they're trapped in the wrong body, that they could be a boy trapped in a girl's body, and so that the solution is to change their physical appearance. Um, in 2007, the first pediatric gender clinic opened its doors in the United States at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, that's only 13 years ago, and today there are over 45 pediatric gender clinics. And if you're a parent of a child who's struggling with their gender identity and you were to take your son or daughter to a gender clinic, you could be told that you need to place your child on puberty-blocking drugs. You need to give your child cross-sex hormones. Uh, never mind that the best data that we have shows that somewhere between 80 to 95% of young people who have a gender identity conflict will naturally grow out of it and will reconcile their identity with their body if they're simply given time to continue developing. If you give them the time and the space to continue developing, the vast, vast, vast majority, 80 to 95% of the children will reconcile with their body. What we know about the alternative for adults who identify as transgender, 41% uh, of adults who identify as transgender attempt suicide at some point in their lives. Uh, and those who have had sex reassignment surgery are 19 times more likely to die by suicide. Those statistics are heartbreaking. Uh, those are tragic. Uh, and it suggests to me that we aren't adequately addressing the underlying struggles, uh, that the underlying struggles are going unaddressed. Um, so what I want to do tonight is go through first um, what the activists, um, the transgender activists, are claiming. Um, the first half of the lecture, and then the second half, how should we evaluate those claims? How should we think about those claims? And Right away, I want to draw that distinction between the activists and then everyone else. And by everyone else, I include people who may identify as transgender, people who may have transitioned. Uh, frequently, they are not the activists who are pushing a certain ideology. They're frequently the victims of the activists because they've been told by a gender expert somewhere, by a counselor somewhere, by a physician somewhere, that the problem was with their body. And so my criticism is not for people who suffer from gender dysphoria, not from people who think that the best chance they have in life is to transition. I view them with deep compassion. Uh, because imagine if you were suffering to such a great extent, you felt so uncomfortable in your own body that you thought removing certain bodily organs and taking the opposite sex hormone was your best chance at happiness in life, right? You, you wouldn't be faking that. You wouldn't be making it up. 
you would really feel alienated from your own body. Um, those individuals, they're being harmed by a harmful ideology. And so what I want to point out here is what the activists are promoting. And so the first thing there is to say that um, people say we live in a postmodern era that's rejected metaphysics, metaphysics just being the philosopher's big w word for being, for nature, for reality. Um, the fact of the matter is that we live in a postmodern age that promotes an alternative metaphysics. It's not that we've rejected reality, we're pr promoting an alternative reality. And so these are fundamentally philosophical claims, but in our culture, the high priests aren't the philosophers and the theologians. In our culture, the high priests are the doctors and the scientists. So we're dressing up philosophical claims about the human person as if they're scientific and medicinal claims. So that if you have a white lab coat, you have more authority than if you're wearing a clerical collar. Because again, in our culture, it's not the priests or the pastors who have cultural authority. It's the doctors and the scientists. So this first slide that I want to show you um, is from a medical doctor at Duke University, a prestigious medical school. She's the founding director of their Center for Adolescent and Child Gender Care. And this is what she said in federal court. She was an expert witness in federal court. She says, from a medical perspective, the appropriate determinant of sex is gender identity. It's counter to medical science to use chromosomes, hormones, internal reproductive organs, external genitalia, or secondary sex characteristics to override gender identity for purposes of classifying someone as male or female. Now, those are some remarkable claims. Uh, and they're philosophical claims. They're not primarily scientific or medical claims, but she's dressing them up as if they are. Now, why do I say those are extraordinary claims? First is that a generation ago, feminists were telling us that sex was merely biological and gender was a social construct. So they were separating sex from gender. Sex is merely the body. Gender is the societal expectations, the social construct. Now we have a medical doctor testifying in court that your gender identity determines your sex. Now, just a decade ago, when I was in school taking biology, we were taught that chromosomes, hormones, internal reproductive organs, external genitalia, and secondary sex characteristics were the bread and butter of biology. Today, if all of those aspects of objective reality conflict with someone's subjective identity, the subjective identity trumps, according to medical science. It's not a medical science claim, it's a philosophical claim. This isn't just happening in courtrooms. It's also important that you know what's happening in your children's classroom. So this is the graphic that's being used, uh, or at least it used to be used, I'll get to that in a moment, in many uh, schools across the country. It's the gender-bred person. And what you can see here is that the gender-bred person says that we each have five different um, spectrums of our identity with respect to our sexuality and our gender. Uh, you'll see at the very top of the graphic, there's gender identity, uh, which they define as, quote, how you in your head define your gender based on how much you align or don't align with what you understand to be the options for gender. Uh, and then in those four blue boxes, it lists four of infinite possibilities uh, because part of the gender identity claim is that it exists along a spectrum. It rejects a gender binary. It's not just two choices. It exists along a spectrum, and it can be fluid so that you could exist, identify male one day, female another, both a third day, neither a fourth day. It need not be binary and it need not be stable. It can be fluid and it can exist along a spectrum. Below that, you'll see gender expression. That's in the yellow, so it's harder to read. Below that, biological sex. Below that, romantic attraction and sexual attraction. And none of these things have to line up. So your romantic attractions and your sexual attractions need not be directed in the same uh, direction. Now, the gender-bred person um, got in trouble. Um, the gender-bred person got in trouble for two reasons. Uh, the first was uh, the gender-bred person was accused of supporting the patriarchy because it looks like a man. It looks like a gingerbread man. And the second reason that the gender-bred person got in trouble is that it says biological sex. And that is now an outdated term. Uh, so the new graphic is the gender unicorn. This is what's being used in the kindergartens, in grade schools, not just here in the United States, but all across the globe. I've, I've spoken on several continents now 
uh, and I've heard from audience members that this graphic's being used in their child's school. And you'll see it's five different spectrums again. But what are the two major changes? First, they used a unicorn. It looks neither like a male or a female. Um, oddly, it's appropriate to embody their worldview since unicorns don't exist. I'm not sure they entirely thought through what they wanted to embody their worldview, but they used a mythical creature. And then second, you'll see that sex assigned at birth is the new phrase. Instead of biological sex, the previous slide had used right there, you'll notice biological sex, the new image, sex assigned at birth. Why do they do this? They claim that biological sex is an ambiguous word that has no scale and no meaning, besides it is related to some sex characteristics. It's also harmful to trans people. Instead, we prefer sex assigned at birth, which provides a more accurate description of what biological sex may be trying to communicate. Now, why does this matter? Because if you're a young child and you're told by your school teacher that your sex was merely assigned at birth, that means it could be reassigned later in life. Right? This graphic is not meant to persuade you or persuade me. This graphic looks like Barney. This graphic is meant to persuade your child or your grandchild about how they should understand their own body and their own identity. It's meant to catechize a child. But instead of being the Westminster Catechism, it's the gender unicorn catechism. How should you think about your own creation, your own bodily nature? Now, from this vision of the human person, right? so we have a certain metaphysic, a certain ontology, a certain anthropology, a certain understanding of human nature, that gives rise to a certain treatment protocol for medicine. If you think about the human person a certain way, you're going to think about medicine a certain way. Uh, so the next thing to, to uh, inform you about is what is the current treatment protocol for young people with gender dysphoria, young people with a gender identity conflict? It's a four-part standard of care. The first part is what's known as social transition. A young child, uh, as young as two or three years old, if they're persistent and insistent and consistent that they're the opposite sex, they should be given a new name and a new wardrobe, be referred to by new pronouns, and they should live as if they are the opposite sex. Uh, you should socially transition them so that they're living life as their true gender identity. Uh, the second stage, uh, the second step in this protocol is as that child approaches puberty, they should be prevented from going through puberty in the, quote, wrong body. Uh, so doctors are using puberty-blocking drugs, which are not FDA-approved for this purpose. They're FDA-approved for a condition known as precocious puberty, the early onset of puberty, to delay puberty to a biologically appropriate age. They're now being used off-label to indefinitely delay puberty so that that 8, 9, 10-year-old boy never develops into a man, the 8, 9, 10-year-old girl never develops into a woman because their real gender identity is something else. Right? Gender identity is what determines sex, remember from the earlier slide. That then sets up the third step of the treatment protocol. Um, as the child now enters uh, uh, the teenage years, um, they should be placed on cross-sex hormones. Uh, the official guidelines uh, suggest around age 16, but increasingly this is happening at younger ages. This means uh, teenage girls will be administered testosterone to masculinize their bodies. Teenage boys will be administered estrogen to feminize their bodies. And what they hope is that this will then mimic the puberty of the correct gender identity. So you had blocked puberty for that boy. You now give him estrogen to try to mimic female puberty. You blocked puberty for that girl. Give, him, give her testosterone to mimic male puberty. This then sets up the fourth, the final step in the treatment protocol. Not everyone will go through necessarily all four steps, but the last step would be uh, um, surgical transition. So you have social transition, puberty blockade, hormonal transition, and then the fourth step, surgical transition. And this can um, entail many different um, aspects of the removal of internal reproductive organs, the removal of external genitalia, the removal of secondary sex characteristics, and then um, uh, plastic surgery to create body parts that resemble the opposite sex for genitalia and for secondary sex characteristics. Officially, the guidelines say you should wait until age 18 uh, to perform these procedures. Uh, increasingly, these are taking place on younger teens, though. 
And as part of a federally funded, NIH funded study in California, there were two 13 year old girls who had double mastectomies performed on them as part of their treatment for gender dysphoria. Uh, so right now your tax dollars have paid to remove the healthy breast tissue from two 13 year old girls as treatment because they didn't feel comfortable in the female body. Why um, this treatment protocol, uh, let me get there right, here we go. Peer reviewed research demonstrates that prepubertal children asserting a different gender identity from the one they were assigned at birth are cognitively capable enough to be aware of the gender they are asserting. The meaning of a child's gender identity assertion at a younger age is no less valid than the meaning of a gender identity assertion of an older child. Um, this is from Dr. Scott Leibowitz, another kind of gender expert, and this was as part of his testimony before a federal court in North Carolina. Um, so prepubertal children have the cognitive capacity to know what their true gender identity is, and then medical science should be used to affirm that gender identity, to transform the body, to line the body up with the gender identity. Uh, for the sake of time, um, sorry, I hit the wrong, I'm going to skip a slide just to get you um, to this slide here. Um, this is from Dr. Diana Aronsaft. She's the Director of Mental Health and Child Adolescent Gender Center at Benioff Children's Hospital. So if you were a parent in the San Francisco area and you wanted to take your child to the best doctor you could find, you would go to the Children's Hospital at the University of California at San Francisco. And this is the Director of Mental Health there um, describing uh, um, children struggling with gender dysphoria. She says, quote, they refuse to pin themselves down as either male or female. Maybe they are a boy girl or a gender hybrid or gender ambidextrous, moving freely between genders, living somewhere in between, or creating their own mosaic of gender identity and expression. As they grow older, they might identify themselves as agender or gender neutral or gender queer. Each one of these children is exercising their gender creativity, and we can think of them as our gender creative children. Now, what's remarkable about this quote is that Dr. Aaron Saft is one of the pioneers of using puberty blocking drugs and cross sex hormones to treat children uh, with gender dysphoria. And so, even as she acknowledges in this quote, that as the child grows older, the gender identity might change. She's making radical transformations into the bodies of young people to transform their bodies in accordance with what they believe about their gender today. And I just want to highlight this for two reasons. One, when I said that you know um, the options aren't just binary of boy, girl, male, female, here you have the director of mental health saying that your child could be a boy girl or a gender hybrid or gender ambidextrous. These are amongst the possibilities. And two, she's prepared to use medical technological interventions on the body of a young person to radically transform uh, that body. Um, feel free, I noticed some of you have pulled out your iPhones to take pictures of the slides. Feel free to do that. If you want the full quotations with citations and everything, everything that's in the slideshow is in the book. Um, so feel free if you want to take pictures, take pictures. Um, you can also find the full references uh, in, the, in the footnotes. Okay, so from the transgender worldview, it gives rise to the transgender medical proposals. It then gives rise um, to uh, the public policy demands. And I want to just mention four areas of public policy that we should be concerned about. Uh, there, there are more than four, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to quickly mention four. First. What sort of lessons will be taught at school as the truth about gender? And even if you're fortunate enough to kind of opt out of the public school system, you can send your child to a Christian school, you can homeschool, you should be just as concerned about what the state is teaching your neighbor's children. What, are, what is being taught as true to the children in the state of Kentucky when it comes to their bodies, to their identities? Is the gender unicorn being used in science class, in biology class, in sexuality class, as if it's the gospel truth? How are young people being catechized to think about their own bodies? Second question, how will access to sex-specific facilities be governed? Will it be based on objective biology, or will it be based on subjective identity? And what I mean by this is, 
when it comes to single sex bathrooms, locker rooms, dorm rooms, hotel rooms, sports teams, will it be females only in allowed in women's bathrooms, girls' bathrooms, girls' sports teams, or will it be people who identify as girls, people who identify as women, people who identify as females? This raises a host of concerns for privacy, for safety, for fairness. Now, the reason why we have separate male and female locker rooms and sports teams in the first place is precisely to provide a modicum of privacy and safety in a condition of undress. The reason this lecture hall is co-ed, there's nothing that we're going to do in tonight's uh, lecture that needs to separate us by sex. But the bathrooms back in the lobby, we have separate male facilities and female facilities. Your children, when they go to school, there are locker rooms, separate facilities for boys and girls, separate sports team for boys and girls. Will that continue to be based the way that it always has been, based on the biological anatomical differences between male and female, or will it be based on identity. And you've probably already seen um, in Connecticut and other New England states, high school track athletes, female athletes losing championships to high school boys who identify as girls, raising the question of where is the fairness in that. So that's the second question. How will we govern sex-specific facilities? Third question, um, will there be speech codes? Will you have to speak someone else's truth? In New York City, you can be fined a quarter million dollars if you intentionally misgender someone. Uh, so if you fail to use the appropriate pronouns, you could be fined up to a quarter million dollars. In Virginia, where I live, a public school teacher has been fired for not using preferred pronouns. Uh, what he said was, I'm just not going to use pronouns at all. I'm not going to speak in a way that makes my student feel uncomfortable, but I'm also not going to speak in a way that reinforces a falsehood. I'm not going to lie in my speech. I'm not going to be part of a, a, a false ideology. And because he wouldn't use the preferred pronouns, uh, he's lost his job. Last question, for fourth area of public policy. How will medicine be regulated by the state? Will doctors be prevented from performing good medicine? And might they be forced to perform bad medicine? And let me give you two examples of this. In 17 states, not yet Kentucky, thankfully, although there is a bill that has been introduced in Kentucky, Doctors can lose their medical license if they help a minor child, so under the age of 18, feel comfortable in their own body. They call that conversion therapy. If you help a boy who identifies as a girl feel comfortable being a boy, that's considered converting their true gender identity. Their true gender identity is girl, and you're engaged in unlawful conversion therapy by helping that individual feel comfortable as a boy. Right? You can see this is Orwellian, that it's conversion therapy to help a boy feel like a boy because they identify as a girl. In all 50 states, by contrast, it's entirely legal to give that boy estrogen, which would be a true form of conversion therapy, transitioning the boy to, to, to appear as a girl. So that's one question. Will doctors be prevented from practicing good medicine? And then the second aspect of this, will they be forced to practice bad medicine? In the very last months of the Obama administration, in May of 2016, the Department of Health and Human Services issued another Obamacare mandate. You're probably familiar with the Obamacare contraception mandate, the Hobby Lobby case, the Little Sisters of the Poor case. There was also a May 2016 mandate that said all healthcare uh, entities had to cover sex reassignment procedures on an equal basis as they do similar procedures, meaning if you're an endocrinologist that does testosterone therapy for men with low testosterone, you'd have to provide testosterone therapy for women who want to identify as men. If you're a surgeon who performs mastectomies in the case of breast cancer, you have to perform mastectomies for women who want to identify as men. There were no religious liberty exemptions to this mandate. There were no considerations for conscience. And there were no considerations simply for best medical judgment. Many physicians, regardless of their religious beliefs, regardless of their moral beliefs, simply think it's bad medicine to remove the healthy breast tissue from the healthy body of a woman who identifies as a man. The medical community is divided on this question. Some doctors think it's good 
to transition patients, many doctors think that's not the appropriate medical response. They think the medical response should focus on the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, not the body. The question will be, will they be forced to practice bad medicine? Will they be prevented from practicing good medicine? So those are four areas of public policy. Um, I want to mention, uh, read one quote, um, uh, just to highlight one aspect of this. Um, and it's right here, I'm gonna skip a slide. Ultimately, the school environment must be set up so that transgender girls are treated like all other girls and transgender boys like all other boys. Now remind yourselves, what is a transgender girl? It's a boy who identifies as a girl. And so the bottom line, ultimately, the boy who identifies as a girl must be treated like all other girls. Dorm rooms, hotel rooms for field trips, bathrooms, locker rooms, sports teams. This is the bottom line, and this is a handbook that was produced by the ACLU, the Human Rights Campaign, Gender Spectrum, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and the National Education Association. So the largest teachers union in America partnered with a left-wing law firm, the ACLU, and then three LGBT activist groups to jointly produce the guidebook uh, for schools on how to handle students who are transitioning. And then, to my mind, the most disconcerting part as um, uh, a recent and young father is uh, what this means uh, for parental rights. Uh, let me see if I can get the next slide. Yep, it's not... Um, advancing to the next slide, but I'll just read it to you. It says, privacy and, there we go, privacy and confidentiality are critically important for transgender students who do not have supportive families. In those situations, even inadvertent disclosures could put the student in a potentially dangerous situation at home. So it's important to have a plan in place to help avoid any mistakes or slip ups. What are they talking about here? How you can make the school safe uh, for transition for a student without their parents knowing about it. Notice the privacy and the confidentiality of the student that doesn't have a supportive family. So your child could, you could drop your uh, son off at school at 8 a.m. dressed as a boy. And the plan here, it's important to have a plan in place to avoid a mistake or a slip up, have a change of clothes waiting for the student in the principal's office and the guidance counselor's office, have jewelry, makeup, et cetera, et cetera. Refer to the student with a female name, female pronoun, and at the end of the day, have the student go back, change back into the original clothes, have two sets of records, one using the female name, one with the male name, one that's used internally, one that's used externally. They actually have a checklist on how you can provide a confidential and safe place for students to transition without their parents knowing about it. Cutting off parental involvement. Uh, and one of the things that I've learned since writing the book and speaking with many parents is that they feel, these are parents who have had children and teenagers and college students transition, they feel like they have been cut off, cut out of the student's life, and that the student had been coached to do so, that the advice they had been giving was to cut the parents out. Okay, so what to think about this? So we're, we're pivoting now from the first part of the lecture, which was what's going on uh, in the words of the transgender activists themselves. I've had lots of quotes, lots of slides to show you. I'm not making any of this up. I don't need to exaggerate. Uh, because it's um, disconcerting enough uh, reality without exaggerating. So how should we evaluate this? The evaluation, I want to go in three steps also, a philosophical, uh, a science, and then a medicine. And then I'm going to wrap up. So philosophically, I think this worldview is just um, uh, uh, swimming in contradictions. There are philosophical contradictions to the transgender worldview. It combines a new form of the ancient heresy of Gnosticism in which our real self is something other than the body, while si simultaneously being materialistic, right? These are materialists who also believe that the real self is something other than the body. And so it's a question of who or what is that real self that's trapped in the wrong body. Uh, many of these people uh, uh, are fully committed materialists, and yet they think we're in the wrong body. Um, it also it oddly relies on rigid sex stereotypes in which boys play with trucks and girls play with dolls, while also simultaneously insisting that gender is merely a social construct and that the facts of human embodiment don't exist. 
And so that raises the question, if gender is merely a social construct, on what basis do we have an internal sense of gender? You can see what this is where you frequently see um, feminists getting upset with transgender activists because they say that it doubles down, they double down on all of the stereotypes that feminists have spent the past generation combating. Uh, when Bruce Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner, the, the photo, the cover image of Vanity Fair was a very stereotypical image of a pinup girl. Precisely what an image of this is a real woman that feminists have been trying to combat. And then lastly, it, it relies on a um, radical expressive individualism where everyone should be free to be themselves and to define the truth as they wish it to be. And yet it also simultaneously enforces a ruthless paternalism where there will be no toleration of dissent. Right? And you see this when any, whenever anyone speaks up to question the ideology, they are forced into conformity. So let me ask you a couple questions to get you thinking about some of these philosophical contradictions. If gender is a social construct, the way that the gender theorists have been telling us for the past generation or two, how can your gender identity be innate and immutable and determined by biology in the womb? How can your gender identity be something that's biologically determined with respect to an ever-changing social construct? If gender is a social construct, how can gender identity be some deep-seated internal sense of gender? But then second question, what does it even mean to have an internal sense of gender? What does gender feel like? Apart from having a body of a certain sort, what does it feel like to feel like a woman? Are all of the women in the church tonight feeling the same way? Have you talked with each other to see if you all have the same feelings? Is that what makes you a woman? That you have an internal sense of femininity or womanhood or an internal feeling of woman that makes you a woman? Or is it that you all have the same body type? You all have a certain incarnate reality, a female way of being human. And that's what makes you women. And there's a rich variety of ways of expressing that, of feeling that, of intuiting that, but the objective reality is that you have a certain sort of body. So that's the question there. How would I know if I was feeling like a woman? Right? So there's an ontological question of what is it to feel like a woman? There's an epistemological question of how would I, as a man, know if I was feeling like a woman? And this is why it's not surprising, given what I said a moment ago about stereotypes, that many of the men who identify as women and then transition as women become very stereotypical women because the only access they have to what it is to feel like a woman or be a woman is based on those stereotypes. Um, to put the question even more pointedly, what does it feel like to feel like both a man and a woman? What does it feel like to feel like neither a man or a woman? How would I know if I was feeling like a man or a woman or both or neither? The only access I have is to how I feel. And I have no idea if it's how the other men in the room feel, how, if it's how the women in the room feel, if it's how both of you feel. We don't have access to the type of knowledge the uh, uh, transgender activists claim. But now another set of metaphysical questions. Why should feeling like a woman, whatever that is, make someone a woman? Right? This is a question about reality. Let's say we could say, this is what it is to feel like a woman. Why would that make you a woman? Our feelings don't determine reality on any other questions, right? If I feel like an old man, it doesn't make me old. If I feel like, um, uh, if I feel like I'm black, it doesn't make me black. Who went along with Rachel Dolezal? Are you familiar with Rachel Dolezal? She was the white woman who felt like she was black, who identified as black, who was running a local NAACP chapter, and no one said, "Oh, she's transracial," right? Her inner sense of race is that she's. Black. What they said is that she's an imposter, she's a fraud, she's a fake, she's a phony, she's a white woman trying to pass as if black. So why should feeling like a woman, even if we could say what that is, make someone a woman? Right, so here's the bottom line on uh, this philosophical part. To a certain extent, gender identity can sound a lot like religious identity. And what I mean by that is identities that are determined by beliefs. But just like religion, those beliefs don't determine reality. Um, 
So a Christian, someone who identifies as a Christian, believes that Jesus is the Christ. Someone who identifies as a Muslim believes that Muhammad is the prophet. Jesus either is or is not the Christ, regardless of what any of us believe. And in the same exact way, someone either is or is not a man, regardless of what any of us believe, including that individual, him or herself. We can have false beliefs. And so the entire part, point of the religious life is to conform our beliefs with the truth. Right? The entire point of the religious life is to conform our beliefs to the truth about God. And then the parallel is true when it comes to gender, to conform our beliefs about ourselves to the truth about ourselves, to conform our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our beliefs to reality. The reality about God, the reality about ourselves. Right? That's the project that's going on here, or at least it should be going on philosophically. Okay, so that's the philosophical uh, 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 set. Move on to some of the scientific set. Um, contrary to what the activist claims, sex isn't assigned at birth, and that's why it can't be reassigned later in life. Sex is a physical, bodily reality built into who we are from the very moment of conception. Uh, the chromosomes that we inherit from our mother and our father, that XX or XY, goes on to determine what sort of reproductive organs are produced in utero as we are a fetus. Those reproductive organs start to produce certain hormones. Those hormones then influence the body structure that we develop in utero, the development of certain internal reproductive organs and external genitalia. So that at week 20, you can go in for an ultrasound and the technician can tell you if you're having a boy or a girl. Sex isn't assigned at ultrasound. The technician isn't assigning a sex to that child. The technician is recognizing an inbuilt reality about how that organism is organized with respect to their sexual identity. And we can do this as well. As I'm standing here looking at it, the room, I'm not assigning a sex to any of you. But I can recognize, based upon your bodily organization, the men in the room and the female in the room. And we do this all the time when we meet each other. Nice to meet you, Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. We can identify people. We're not assigning something. We're recognizing inbuilt realities. And science can't change that. You can't reassign sex later in life. What you can do is you can feminize a male body and you can masculinize a female body. Uh, sex reassignment isn't possible. What you can do is you can uh, amputate various body parts. You can cosmetically create body parts that resemble the opposite sexes, but you don't actually turn men into women or women into men. So Dr. Larry Mayer says, scientifically speaking, transgender men are not biological men and transgender women are not biological women. The claims to the contrary are not supported by a scintilla of scientific evidence. And then uh, Robbie George at Princeton, my co-author, changing sexes is a metaphysical impossibility because it is a biological impossibility. So now some of the medical outcomes, um, precisely because um, it's philosophically incoherent and it's physically impossible, sex reassignment attempts don't actually provide the good outcomes that we are all hopeful for. They don't actually restore wholeness and happiness and life satisfactions uh, for people. So here's Dr. Paul McHugh. He writes, transgender men do not become women, nor do transgender women become men. All, including Bruce Jenner, he was writing this essay shortly after the 2020 interview of Bruce Jenner, all become feminized men or masculinized women, counterfeits or impersonators of the sex with which they identify. In that lies their problematic future. When the tumult and shouting dies, it proves not easy nor wise to live in a counterfeit sexual garb. The most thorough follow-up of sex reassigned people extending over 30 years and conducted in Sweden, where the culture is strongly supportive of the transgender, documents their lifelong mental unrest. 10 to 15 years after surgical reassignment, the suicide rate of those who had undergone sex reassignment surgery rose to 20 times that of comparable peers. Um, three important things to know about Dr. McHugh. First, he was educated at Harvard. Uh, he went to Harvard College as an undergraduate. Then he went to Harvard Medical School. 
Then he was uh, hired by Johns Hopkins Hospital and Johns Hopkins Medical School. He was the psychiatrist in chief and the chair of the psychiatry department when in 1979 he shut down the sex reassignment clinic. Because back in the 70s, he knew that this was bad medicine, that it wasn't actually healing people, that people were coming to a hospital suffering and the doctors were not addressing the underlying causes. Um, Hopkins, that sex reassignment clinic, remained shut down until two years ago. McHugh is now uh, retired, uh, and Hopkins has a new uh, chief of psychiatry, a new uh, chair of the psychiatry department, uh, and they now perform reassignment procedures. Um, second thing to point out here, what McHugh is pointing out is that um, there's an underlying struggle for someone with gender dysphoria, and then there's an additional struggle of trying to live in what he describes as counterfeit sexual garb. He says it proves not easy nor wise for me to try to live as if I was a woman for someone else to try to live this as if they were a man. And then lastly, to point out, Sweden, one of the most progressive countries in the world, that's where this study that showed 10 to 15 years after the reassignment procedures, a 19 times greater likelihood of death by suicide. Um, which means it's very hard to say, oh, it's just you know all of the bigots in Alabama that are causing the problems here. Uh, in Sweden, one of the most progressive places in the world, we still see these terrible outcomes, which suggests to Dr. McHugh that something else is the cause. It's not uh, a bigoted culture, but it's an underlying struggle that's not being treated. Right, so that was Dr. McHugh. Um, next slide I want to read you. Um, this is uh, Guardian, the newspaper in the United Kingdom. The Guardian, this is not a right-wing newspaper. This is mainstream paper. They asked Birmingham University to conduct a um, literature review. This is Guardian describing the review. Guardian Weekend asked Birmingham University's aggressive research intelligence facility to assess the findings of more than 100 follow-up studies of post-op transsexuals. ARIF, which conducts re reviews of healthcare treatments for the NHS, concludes that none of the studies provides conclusive evidence that gender reassignment is beneficial for patients. Let me read that. None of the studies provides conclusive evidence that gender reassignment is beneficial for patients. It found that most research was poorly designed, which skewed the results in favor of physically changing sex. There was no evaluation of whether other treatments such as long-term counseling might help or whether their gender confusion might lessen over time. This was Guardian pointing out, this was a decade ago that they did this literature review, that there's no conclusive evidence that this benefits patients and that most of the research is poorly designed to not even consider alternative therapies. That it's like, as if it's looking at just one particular outcome uh, because there's like a vested interest at stake here. Uh, then in 20, 2014, so now just six years ago, Hayes Incorporation, this is a consulting company that hospitals and health insurance plans use to determine what sort of coverage should we provide, what's going to actually be beneficial. Uh, they point out from their literature review, significantly statistic improvements have not been consistently demonstrated by multiple studies for most outcomes. Evidence regarding quality of life and function in male to female adults was sparse. Evidence for less co comprehensive measures was sparse and or conflicting. The study designs do not permit conclusion of causalities, and studies generally had weaknesses with execution. There are potentially long-term safety risks, but none have been proven or conclusively ruled out. So what are they acknowledging just six years ago? This is all experimental. They're doing an experiment on people. And that uh, improvements have not been, statistic statistically significant improvements have not been consistently demonstrated. Right? That's their way of saying the science actually doesn't support this for being good for people. All right, if you don't believe Paul McHugh, if you don't believe um, uh, Birmingham University, if you don't believe the Hayes, uh, Hayes Incorporation, would you believe the Obama administration? And that's not a trick question uh, because on this issue, they actually accurately reported what the science shows. So this is from a 2016, this is the proposed memo for Medicare and Medicaid services. They wrote, based on a thorough review of the clinical evidence available at this time, there is not enough evidence to determine whether gender reassignment surgery improves health outcomes for Medicare beneficiaries with gender dysphoria. There were conflicting, inconsistent study results. Of the best designed studies, some report benefits while others report harms. 
the quality and strength of evidence were low due to the mostly observational study designs with no comparisons, potential confounding of causes and small sample sizes. Many studies that reported positive outcomes were exploratory studies with no confirmatory follow-up. So this is the Obama administration just pointing out how bad the scientific literature uh, is on this. That was the proposed memo. Um, two months later in August of 2016, they come out with the final memo, the decision memo, and here you can just see they point out all of those same um, uh, uh, quality control problems with the studies, uh, observational study designs, no comparison groups, subjective endpoints, potential confounding of causes, small sample sizes, lack of validated assessments tools, and this last phrase, considerable loss to follow up. A considerable number of patients who have been lost to follow up, um, either because they have just dropped out of the study or because we can no longer find them. Uh, and the fear there is that many of those have been lost to follow up due to suicide. Um, but they can't confirm that. And so it's just, this is a problem with the research literature. Let me read you one more quote from uh, this particular study. It says, I'm going to read this um, halfway through, so uh, halfway through the slide. After careful assessment, we identified six studies that could provide useful information. So think about that. Out of all of the hundreds of studies that the media likes to talk about, the Obama administration said six of them could actually be helpful, that they were well done. Of these, the four best designed and conducted studies that assessed quality of life before and after surgery using validated psychometrics did not demonstrate clinically significant changes or differences in psychometric test results after GRS, gender reassignment surgery. So let me translate that into English. Imagine that you're a patient who is suffering. You're depressed, you have anxiety, you feel uncomfortable in your own body. And it's so severe that you're willing to go to a doctor to have radical surgery performed on your body to make your anxiety, your depression, your sense of alienation, your sense of discomfort go down. You're not faking this, you're not making it up, you're really suffering. The Obama administration says the best studies that they could identify shows no clinically significant change after the gender reassignment surgery. So whatever it was that you were struggling with that took you to the surgeon's office that day, it hasn't changed. No clinically significant change after gender reassignment surgery. That's what they're reporting in 2016. And then they point to the same study that Dr. McHugh points to. Uh, it says, um, uh, this is the Swedish study, second sentence, the mortality was primarily due to completed suicides, 19.1 fold greater than in controlled Swedes. Next sentence, we note mortality from this patient population did not become apparent until after 10 years. So many of these studies that the media highlights, many of the stories that the media tells are people who a year or two later are happy with their uh, treatment. So imagine that you've um, you're, you're convinced that you're actually the opposite sex and you finally get the surgery that makes you look like the opposite sex. At first, you're elated. You're finally getting to feel comfortable. You're finally getting to live as your true, your true gender identity. But then 5, 10, 15 years later, none of those underlying struggles have reconciled. They haven't gone away and you're finding it harder and harder to continue to persuade people to present yourself as the opposite sex. That's when the spike in suicides manifested, right? And the media doesn't want to talk about that because if you're not doing a longitudinal study, if you're just doing a study of one year after surgery, and if it's a self-reported study, you might not be capturing all of these uh, nuances, these realities. All right, um, for the sake of time, let me um, uh, um, wrap up with um, uh, two conclusion, uh, two kind of like summations. One is what should we do for children? Uh, and then two, I want to share some uh, a personal testimony. What Paul McHugh, Dr. McHugh does is he draws an analogy to anorexia and bulimia. And he says that no doctor worth his or her salt would prescribe liposuction to a high school girl suffering from anorexia because the problem's not with her body. Right? The problem's with her thoughts, her feelings, her emotions. And so what a good doctor would do is try to figure out what is causing the body image problem or the eating disorder. And those are separate things right there. Body image and eating disorders are separate things. What is the underlying etiology? What is the underlying causality for this particular patient with this particular set of struggles? Let's figure it out and then let's address the therapy at that problem. But the problem is not with the body. 
And so uh, a solution is not going to lie in tinkering with the body. We need to figure out why this patient feels uncomfortable, thinks she's overweight, thinks she's unattractive, has struggles with eating uh, uh, um, disorders, and then direct the therapy there. Do the same thing uh, for um, a child with gender dysphoria. Figure out why this child feels uncomfortable in his or her body. Uh, it could be bullying at school. It could be a family dynamic. It could be a cognitive problem uh, that they've been um, educated to believe that all real boys play with GI Joes and like football and hunting and they don't like any of those things so they're not a real boy. It could be a problem at school where the other boys are picking on that boy because the boy's smaller, the boy's more diminutive, the boy's not rambunctious and rowdy and so forms closer friendships with girls at school and so as a coping mechanism from the bullying the boy identifies as a girl. It could be a sibling rivalry problem. Some of the clinical literature shows that second ch uh, children, as the second child enters the family, frequently the older child, if they're of different sexes, might identify as the second child's sex as a way of currying favor with the mother. None of this is explicit, right? The child's not rationalizing this, but there's a newborn baby who's a girl. The mom and the dad are all showing attention to the newborn. The older child might think, oh, if I was a girl. I would get attention. One of the examples that I cite in the book comes from a Canadian clinic where a mother had two children, a boy and a girl. Um, the uh, boy is identifying as a girl. She takes the boy to see a therapist and the therapist says, you know, why do you think you're a girl? And the child said, mommies love little girls more than they love little boys. And so that set off the antenna of the therapist. So she had a conversation with the mother after the session saying, you know, your son today said that mommies love little girls more than love little boys. Do you have any idea why? And what came out was that the mother had been sexually assaulted and she had never gotten the healing she needed. And she couldn't be physically affectionate with her son the way that she could with her daughter. And her son was picking up on this. And he was identifying as a girl as a way of trying to get some of his mother's affection. So the treatment protocol here had nothing to do with the boy at all. What they did was they got the mother the healing she needed after her sexual assault so that she could be affectionate with both her son and her daughter, and then her son was identifying as a boy again. He was spared a lifetime of trips to the endocrinologist's office to receive estrogen, spared a lifetime of transition care. So that's what the alternative uh, looks like, trying to identify what's the underlying cause. It could be a variety of factors, a good clinician would talk to the child, talk to the family, uh, look at the environment and figure out what in this situation uh, is causing this. And then I want to read you, um, this is scrolling ahead, um, uh, um, uh, a testimony. Uh, this you can find uh, online on YouTube. This is where I uh, first came across it. Uh, it's from Carrie Stelly and Stella, and she writes, I was put on hormones after three months of therapy at the age of 17. In fact, because I was only seeing a therapist once per month, it was after three or four visits that I was prescribed testosterone. With no me oh, the slide just went down for me, so I'll read it over here. Uh, with no meaningful attempt made to process the issues that I brought up that led in part to my wish to transition. When I was transitioning, no one in the medical or psychological field ever tried to dissuade me to offer other options, to really do anything to stop besides tell me that I should wait until I was 18. I want to ask you, how many other medical conditions are there where you can walk into the doctor's office, tell them you have a certain condition, which has no objective test, which can be caused by trauma or mental health issues or societal factors, and receive life-altering medications on your say-so? And then the next slide, can, uh, can we, uh, I can't advance, oh, here we go. Every now and again, it uh, shows me as losing internet connection, sorry. Um, and then so this last slide, oh, one too far, there we go. She says, I wanted to make a video previously so that folks can see that I'm a real live person, but I didn't out of fear of showing my face. But I think it's important when we talk about these issues to really understand that women like us aren't just statistics, not just some dry data some gatekeeping doctor might throw at you. We're real people. This is a real outcome of transition. I'm a real live 22-year-old woman with a scarred chest and a broken voice and five o'clock shadow because I couldn't face the idea of growing up to be a woman. That's my reality. So if you're um, seeing what she's saying here, 
The scarred chest is from the double mastectomy. The five o'clock shadow is from the testosterone changing her facial hair follicles. The um, changed voice, the broken voice is from the testosterone thickening and densening her vocal cords. She transitioned at age 17, started on testosterone at age 18, had the double mastectomy, and then at age 22 regretted it and has detransitioned. And where does she go to get her body back? Where does she go to get her life back? It's, um, it's going to be an entire generation of young people uh, who will be uh, harmed in this way. Uh, and that's what's at stake. It's what uh, motivates um, uh, the family policy groups that are working on this. It's what motivates people like me, people like Andrew, people like Denny. How can we better understand what's going on so that we can better direct therapies at people to help them feel comfortable in their own bodies? And so then the question is, what can we do as a culture to make a culture more supportive of the truth about our bodily incarnation as male or female, about the ways that we should give expression to that bodily reality of male or female. So with that, I'm done. I'm going to invite uh, Andrew up, and Den I think Andrew's going to introduce Denny, and we're going to field your questions. Um, so feel free to um, think up your questions. Andrew's going to moderate for us, uh, and thank you for your attention. Ryan, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we're going to have a hard stop at 9 o'clock to respect everyone's time and to, and to get us out at a decent hour. Denny, the first question I have for you, uh, I want to introduce you. Denny Burke is the president of the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, and he's also a professor at Boyce College and Southern Seminary over in Louisville. Denny, would you just describe the work of CBMW and what it is and how folks out here could get involved? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, Ryan, thank you so much for that. I mean, the, the work that he does is just tremendous. If you have not read When Harry Became Sal Sally, you, you need to get the book. It is, it is, I, I recommend it all the time. And it's a book designed for people wanting to understand the facts of the case and to understand it. It's not based on theological propositions. It's based on reason and um, ba ba basically publicly accessible arguments. So it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful book. Our organization, the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, which I'm the president of, it's a little bit different. We care about the same things. We have the same views on these things, but we're not focused on public policy as much as we are focused on churches and ministries and trying to advocate for what the church's teaching from Scripture has always been on these things. These are brand new challenges, and what we're finding in so many churches and ministries is that we're losing ground. In the places that are supposed to be holding the ground, we're, we're losing the ground. Um, I don't know if you saw, but, uh, well, I know you saw this. Back in 2015 when Bruce Jenner made his transition to Caitlyn Jenner, it was all over the country. It was, you know, big-time news. And even CT did an editor did a feature story on it, uh, Christianity Today, the, magazine, the Journal of Evangelical Conviction. Its uh, cover story was written by Mark Yorhouse. Mark Yorhouse wrote... When he wrote his book, uh, he wrote a, that cover story. He also wrote a book not long after that called Understanding Gender Dysphoria, which was all about transgenderism. And at the time, Andrew's book wasn't out. His book wasn't out. It was the only book really by an evangelical yeah. on transgenderism. The book was reviewed at the Gospel Coalition website. Um, and the Gospel Coalition website even said, this marks a step forward in evangelical engagement on gender issues. But the book... Um, allows for, in certain cases, uh, gender, uh, uh, basically sex change surgeries. Uh, it allows for children to, to identify as the opposite sex if they're dealing with gender-confused feelings. And this, was, this is not, you know, from outside of our movement. This was from inside of our movement, and it kind of just went unnoticed. And so that's just one example where we've seen some a kind of a loss of ground on some things, even among those who are naming themselves as evangelicals and within the movement. So our organization, the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, one of the, the main things that we're trying to do is to point churches and Christian ministries back to the faith that's once for all delivered to the saints and how that applies to these new challenges that we're facing now because these are not arguments about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. These are things that we're dealing with in our churches we're dealing with among parishioners, um, folks in my church. I also serve as a pastor in my church. They're dealing with it at their work. Anybody that's dealing with an HR department, they're trying to figure out how to be faithfully Christian in, in really difficult situations, and many of them don't know what to think about these things. 
If you're working in the public schools, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real challenge. One of the things that we brought on our table out back uh, was a, uh, an effort that we worked on back in 2017, trying to draw together evangelical leaders and um, church leaders and scholars together, together to come up with a kind of a consensus statement. It doesn't say everything that can be said about what we believe about sexuality, but we tried to say some things that were necessary to be said. And we came up with a document that became known as the Nashville Statement. And so our ministry in large part exists to um, advance the Nashville Statement, and, or at least the vision of the Nashville Statement in churches and ministries and trying to call people back to what this, the Bible teaches about these things. So that's what we do. Brian, uh, the question I have for you is uh, I want you to respond to an argument that uh, legislators probably hear mm-hmm. quite frequently. Uh, it's probably the strongest argument made to silence dissenting opinion in this conversation. And the argument is this. If you fail to, to uh, unequivocally affirm transgender individuals, uh, that will lead to higher rates of uh, thoughts of suicide, suicide, depression, anxiety, self-harm. How do you respond to an argument like that to equip people outside? Um, great questions. I mean, the, the first is to say that there's no evidence for that proposition. So that's just a sheer assertion that um, unless you affirm someone in their preferred gender identity, you're going to be the cause of increased suicidal thoughts or increased um, suicide attempts. Um, so one would just be, where's the evidence of this? Um, you're making an assertion, so me some actual evidence. Um, two would be, undoubtedly it is true um, that if people are mistreated, if people are ridiculed, mock, rejected, that that will increase their anxiety, their depression, and their suicide ideation. But there's a world of difference between rejecting, mocking, ridiculing people and then affirming um, their preferred gender identity. And the space in between is exactly what Kent said at the beginning. We're going to be speaking the truth in love, right? Truth and grace need to go together. And they can never be opposed because if grace isn't truthful, it's not real grace. And if truth isn't gracious, it's not real truth, right? Uh, These things necessarily go together. And so the most loving thing you can do uh, for someone who's experiencing gender dysphoria, dysphoria is to help them discover the truth about themselves. Uh, and that means like you need to walk with them, you need to not reject them, not ridicule them, not mock them, but you also cannot lie to them. Right? Because you're not doing anything in their long-term best interest if you tell them, oh yes, you really are a boy trapped in a girl's body. You should go on uh, estrogen. You should have this. Sur- no, what you want to say is, look, I love you. I'm going to be there for you. We're going to be friends no matter what through thick and f- or th- thick or thin, um, but I don't think it's a good idea for you to think of yourself as the opposite sex. I don't think it's a good idea for you to go on the hormones for you to have surgery because it's not true, right? And um, uh, you may be the only person in that person's life who's willing to speak the truth in love, right? There'll be some people who might speak the truth in a very rejectful, hateful way. There might other be people who, oh, the way that I have to uh, love this person as well as telling them what they want to hear. Both of those are false um, options. Right? The, the option that we're called to is speaking the truth in love. And I don't see any reason why we would think that on this single issue, doing that causes suicide when it doesn't do it on any of the other issues. I think it's really important for us to understand the types of arguments that are being made in this conversation. So Ryan is a very articulate philosopher and natural lawyer, so he's appealing to medicine and to philosophy and to sociology, and he's not appealing uh, in his argument on scripture. Although nothing Ryan believes or says is opposed to what scripture teaches. Uh, But that begs the question of what does scripture have to say about what it means to be made male and female? And are those truths something that can be understood rationally as well? So, Denny, my question for you is, uh, what does it mean to be made male and female in God's image? Yeah, this is a great question. And this is another one of those areas where I think we've lost ground in in so many evangelical churches. In fact, I received a letter from um, parents of a transgender child um, a few years ago, several years ago, and they had heard some of the things that I'd been teaching publicly and had written, and they were really upset with me because they were parents of a transgender child, which is now an adult, and this child had transitioned to, from a male to a female, had divorced his wife, 
and broken up his family with children as a result of this transition. But the, the parents were arguing to me in, in the letter that what you're teaching is wrong because, you know, this, our child has a, a female brain, even though he's got a male body. And so they're not rejecting Christianity to, to hold to this. They're, they're combining it with a Christian commitment, they say, that, look, his, his brain, it's a biological thing. His brain is female. His body is male. And, you know, his, he's, he has the wrong genitals was, was the argument that they made. And it's really hateful on your part to argue otherwise that this is a wrong identity. Now, the, the issue is, is that this kind of confuses things because it does sound like a biological argument for, for male or female, but it's, it's located in the brain. The, the, the problem with that is, there's all kinds of natural law problems with that, but in special revelation, when you look at Genesis chapter 1, it says in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, and then it says in chapter 20, uh, verse 26 and 27, God um, created man in his own image, in his own image he created them, male and female he created them. And so... Some of these revisionists will say, well, yeah, we believe in male and female, but it's determined by brain structures. These parents that had written to me had adopted, I don't think they knew it, but they had adopted what's known as a brain sex theory of uh, sexual uh, transgender development. It's one theory among many. It's not, there's no medical consensus about this, but that's what they had adopted. And so they were reading that back into, I think, the biblical account. But here's the issue. When you read Genesis chapter 1, and it says, God made them in his own image as male and female. Is, is he talking about brain structures and function? Is that what defines male and female? The answer to that question is no, because we don't procreate with our brains. In other words, it, it, he says male and female, he created them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In other words, it's intrinsically connected to being male and female is this procreative capacity. So biblically speaking, the way that we would define what a male and a female are is a male and a female are so labeled according to the body's organization for reproduction, which is the phrase that you use in, in, in your book. And it's the, it's the right one. It's a physical reality. And so what he's arguing on natural law grounds is certainly cl- true on scriptural grounds. So that when, when we, when, when you're dealing with a gender confused child, what you're going to want to do, and, and there is a mismatch. We don't deny that, there, that people feel real distress over this, and we feel real compassion for them, and our real aim is to relieve the distress that they're feeling. But we would argue that on the basis of truth, that we would want them to resolve those differences in a way that affirms the body, not in a way that, that mutilates the body, because we know that God's revealing something true about who we are as human beings based on the body's organization for reproduction. So it's possible that there are people in the audience who have family members who might be identifying as transgender or struggle with gender dysphoria, and they're wondering what they tell this loved one. Uh, We know that kind of secular academy, secular science is saying affirm, 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 pursue invasive therapies and potentially surgeries. Uh, There's an alternate possibility, an explanation. Uh, Ryan, you talk about this in your book. What are some... Uh, alternatives to help people deal with these yeah. real experiences of gender confusion. Yeah, this is what um, uh, medical doctors had been doing um, throughout the normal course of treatment for people with gender dysphoria. This is what Dr. McHugh was doing um, since the day he shut down the sex reassignment clinic at Johns Hopkins up until the day he retired. And he still he sees patients one day one day a week, and he's in his 80s now, um, but he's no longer um, the psychiatrist in chief at Hopkins. Um, and, and you can think of this as two ways. If you have a disconnect between my bodily reality and my thoughts and my feelings, you could either try to change my bodily reality to line up my body with my mistaken thoughts or fe- and feelings, or you can try to line up my thoughts and my feelings with reality, including the reality of my body. And what McHugh points out is that the history of psychiatry and psychology and mental health has always been we try to align mistaken thoughts and feelings with reality. Whether those are the mistaken thoughts and feelings of a high school girl with anorexia, whether those are the mistaken thoughts and feelings of someone who is struggling um, with suicide ideation because they think they have no worth in life, no purpose in life. They have thoughts and feelings that aren't in alignment with reality. And in this case, you have someone with thoughts and feelings that aren't in alignment with the reality of their body. So rather than doing what is impossible, 
transforming a body to line up with the mistaken beliefs. Do what is possible. Help people line up their thoughts, their feelings, their beliefs with reality. And then it just look, I mean, when you say, you know, what does that look like? It looks like as many different um, psychotherapy techniques as are in existence, right? So any kind of like lawful, um, appropriate um, uh, kind of psychotherapeutic technique that exists for any other condition could be deployed uh, in a situation of gender dysphoria, depending on what those underlying causes are, are. Because what we also know is that normally gender dysphoria does not present in isolation. Normally it's one factor amongst many. And frequently what the therapist will do is they'll focus on the other factors. And as you start addressing the un other factors, the gender dysphoria goes away. Um, and so Walt Heyer, um, a, a friend of many of ours, uh, he lived as a woman for eight years. Uh, as a 40-something-year-old man, um, he left his wife and children, had the surgery, lived as Lara Jensen for eight years, and then uh, it was only when he was working at a hospital um, uh, and a doctor there, a psychiatrist there, said, Walt, I think you have a dissociative disorder sent him to see a, and at that point, Laura, because he was living as Laura at the time, said, Laura, I think you have a dissociative order, sent him to see not a gender expert, but just a normal uh, psychiatrist. As he got help for his dissociative disorder, he then discovered that the gender dysphoria was dissipating. He went back to identifying as a man. And so in this case, it wasn't even primarily targeted at the gender dysphoria. It was a different uh, psychological issue that once he got healing for that, it also then resolved the gender problem. So uh, we're going to have time for two more quick questions, uh, and you can both address this. A very practical question that many people have, the pronoun issue. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you answer? Should we use someone's preferred pronouns? I'll answer first. Um, my short answer to that is, and I have no idea what your view is on this, <laughs> so if we disagree, we'll find out in a second. Um, my answer is no. And it's a part of the duty of, there's, there's two things that we're concerned about here, okay? Because the Ephesians 4.15 that Ryan was quoting a minute ago, we have an obligation to speak the truth in love, which means we're, we're not authorized um, by God or by the faith to speak things that are not true. And to indulge fictions, I don't think is, is, is loving or helpful, true or right at all. So you, you wouldn't want to do that. So that's the first principle. The second principle, though, that I think is important for people to understand, you know, the Bible does say in Romans 12, as far as it is up to you, live it, be at peace with all men. Which means that every single, every conflict that's possible for you to have over these issues, it's not necessarily wise for you to have them. Yeah. In, in other words, you shouldn't be seeking out opportunities to offend on this issue. You know, you've got to go to work. You've got to, you know, deal with colleagues and all, and, and all of this. And so for, for the most part, when you're talking to people face-to-face, -face, when we use second-person pers personal pronouns, they're not inflected for gender. So it, it's not really a problem. It, when, when it's a problem is when you're talking about someone and it becomes difficult. But I would argue even in the difficult moments, you shouldn't. Um, you should always speak the truth, and you should speak the truth in love. One more thing I, I want to say here. Um, just as a pastoral question, as I'm talking to people in, in church and elsewhere, I, I do think that you have different responsibilities to people based on your differing relationships. Pronouns are one thing. Proper names are another. Um, sometimes you're going to meet somebody that's a stranger, and the only name you know is what they give you. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've met a transgender woman one time. Uh, it was a man, but um, identifying as a woman... This uh, man was serving as a pastor somewhere, as a transgender, and I, the only name I knew was what the one that, that he gave me, okay? But if somebody in my family or somebody that I was close to were transitioning, I would feel uh, differently about that proper name. Um, I, in other words, I, I would probably want to push back on that, and I want to say, you know, I'm not going to go along with this, this fiction. So there are different levels of responsibility. I think the pronouns are... I'm pretty dogmatic about the pronouns. I think the proper names are more difficult depending on the relationship, but that's where, that's where I am on it. I, I agree with everything Denny just said, so no disagreement. The, the only thing I would add, um, and I think this is entirely consistent with um, what Denny is saying in his second point of like, don't go out of your way to kind of like pick fights and provoke, be at peace with people. 
Uh, and the only ad additional thing I would add to that um, is as much as possible, you want to be in the lives of people who are struggling with gender dysphoria because you want them to be able to talk to you if a year from now or five years from now or 10 years from now, they're having second thoughts and they want to detransition. If they want, you want them to have you in their life as someone to get a second opinion from, right? And so not only like kind of like, you know, be at peace, don't needlessly provoke, but see what you can do. Uh, have that conversation. Look, you know I can't use female pronouns. You know I can't call you by a new name because I don't believe you're actually a woman. What can I do to show you that I love you so that we can be in long-term relationship, right? Our goal should be we're not going to be persuading someone in one conversation, in one meal. What can I do to maintain long-term loving relationship with this individual so that when they're ready to hear what I'm trying to say, I'm still in their life to say it, right? That, that to my mind. And I don't, you know, there's no kind of like universal rule of what the answer to that is. But like, I think within the boundaries that Denny has set up, stay within those boundaries and then this should be, you know, the goal that we have is how do we maintain that long-term relationship? Ryan, we'll end uh, with you. One of the cardinal virtues is, ju or courage. Justice also, Justice yes, is courage, as well. yes. Courage, <laughs> as I'm thinking of. Uh, this is a culturally intimidating issue to engage on. Most people are not activists. They're moms and dads and employees, and they want to go on with their lives. How do we have courage? Yeah, I mean, so the how do we have courage is, um, uh, well, actually, it's easier to answer in a certain sense. Um, I could not do what I do in the public square uh, if I was not grounded in my faith and if I was not consistently reinforced kind of through grace in these convictions. Even though, as any pointed out, everything I've said tonight has been kind of like natural law, public reason, everything that would be accessible whether you have faith or not. What kind of gives me the courage to do that uh, is the conviction that Christ is the Lord of everything and that the vocation that we all have is to bear witness to the truth. And there are a variety of ways of bearing witness to the truth. I, I think that since God created nature, natural law will always be fully consistent with revealed law. Uh, and that uh, my vocation is to bear witness to the truth using the tools of natural law. Denny's vocation is to bear witness to the truth using the tools of revealed theology, right? And we're both fulfilling our vocation. Um, and I don't think you can do this and have that courage if you try to do it through your own willpower. You try to like pull yourself up from your bootstraps, try to like, do this. Uh, and so I think there, you, there needs to be kind of spiritual preparation for this. People who are engaged in this discussion beforehand, you need, if you're going to have a difficult conversation with a family member, a friend, a colleague, you need to pray about this. Prepare yourself uh, spiritually. But then the second thing is that you also need to prepare yourself um, merely on kind of like the knowledge issue. I imagine most people here tonight feel comfortable having a conversation about abortion. They know how to talk about the right to life. Um, are you as comfortable talking about gender dysphoria and transgender medicine? And if the answer is no, that's fine. This is a new issue, right? We've been reading about, talking about, preparing to discuss the abortion issue for decades now. We haven't been doing that on these uh, issues. Andrew's book is a great resource. Um, I think my book is a decent resource, right? There, there are things that have been produced um, that you can use to equip yourselves for those conversations. And I think those are the two things, right? If you don't have the knowledge, you're not going to have the courage. And if you don't have the grounding in something bigger than yourself, something that ultimately is the foundation of all truth, goodness, and beauty, you're not going to be able to do this. Thank you. Would you join me in thanking Ryan and Denny? And Kent, unless you have any other instructions, I'm going to dismiss us, or do you want to dismiss? Yeah, I'll, I'll dismiss. I'll dismiss. Thank you all again very much. Uh, very enlightening, very articulate, very clear, very loving, and very truthful. Thank you all for taking the time to come. Because as they said, with the life issue, we, we pretty much have that down. We know how to engage folks and share the truth in a loving way. But the terminology used tonight... These are the experts, and we all need to grow up in that. So thank you very much for taking time. If any of you all would like to have some publications that, that uh, address the General Assembly that's going on, we have a number of them that you can take back to your church and share. It has a number of bills, legislation that's been offered. would love to have you uh, take those back and share them with your friends at church. 
And if any of you would have enjoyed this seminar and would like to see more of them on different issues, uh, there's uh, some return envelopes out there. If you want to grab one and make a contribution to the Family Foundation, you may. But please don't feel obligated. Uh, we wanted to give you this information from these folks uh, to strengthen you and strengthen the church.